Okay, well, thanks uh, for the talk. Um, Jack is here for questions and Neil as well. So um, go ahead and enter your questions into Slack and we'll read those questions off. I'll, alternatively, you can raise your hand in Zoom and I will promote you and you can ask your question in, per, uh, yeah, in person. We can't quite hear you, Rob. You're super quiet, but I'll, I'll read the first question in Slack. I can tell that's what you were saying. The first question comes from uh, John Osterhout um, from Stanford. He's asking, um, does Go support multiple concurrent user space schedules? So, and if it does, like, how do you handle conflicts when multiple schedulers attempt to schedule threads on the same core at the same time? Sure. Um, yeah, so Go definitely supports multiple user space schedulers. Um, and it has extensive support for composition and partitioning of the machine. So a couple examples are you can partition the machine into groups of CPUs called enclaves. And each enclave contains a set of agents that schedule only the CPUs in that enclave. You can also layer policies in an agent, similar to what Linux does, where you have higher priority scheduling classes and lower priority classes. And then last, um, as a last resort, we have a transaction API that lets you atomically commit transactions. So even if multiple agents try to commit uh, you know, a task onto the same uh, CPU at the same time, uh, only one of those transactions will atomically succeed while the other fails. So I, I, I just want to ask one question for my own <laughs> clarification on that too. You know, when I was looking at the paper, I think the transactions were a little bit confusing me in that way. Do they serve another purpose besides that? So this solves John's problem, but um, what's, the, what's the main purpose for, like what, uh, I, I assume that when there's contention and you try to schedule the same P CPU at the same time, then basically one, one of the schedulers kind of gets an abort back. So um, is that the main, the main motivation for the transactions? Well, transactions also allow us to implement synchronization of state between the user space agents and the kernel. So because these agents are not running in the kernel themselves, uh, you have to communicate thread state to them through messages. And as a result, we want to have a mechanism to make sure the agents are always updating, are always operating on the most up-to-date information. And if they're not, then we want to, to, to somehow notify them as, of that. So when you try to commit a transaction, uh, we, we have the full details in the paper. Basically, you include a, a counter, the last counter you read from the kernel. If there are pending messages that you haven't read yet, then the agent will have an out-of-date counter. And then the one it includes in the transaction will cause that transaction to be, to, to be rejected and failed. And then because it's atomic, you get really nice uh, state cleanup and don't have to worry about anything. I think that makes sense I, to me. Go ahead. I now. think an important, an important property is that transactions allow us to um, schedule threads on CPUs in an asynchronous manner. If you imagine we had to use a syscall as an API, the global agent would be blocked and you would have a sort of a scheduling block out on let's say 100 CPUs. But with transactions, you can stage, you can open 100 transactions for 100 CPUs and then you can let them pick them up opportunistically, for example, on a clock deck or maybe on return to user space. And only when it's absolutely necessary to commit the transaction at a specific time, would you need to go into the kernel and do a synchronous call and send IPIs. Uh, transactions also allows us to sort of look towards the future where scheduling policy can run in an offload domain, for example, a smart make. Uh, that wouldn't be possible with a syscall API. Yeah, and um, a couple more points to add. So this asynchronous transaction commit, um, is similar in nature to what Kaladin uh, did with offloading scheduling overhead to the remote CPUs. You can also batch transactions together and commit them at once and set a batch API to amortize uh, IPI overhead. So there's a wide variety of, of benefits to them. And we also are looking into using BPF for scheduling too. And we have some initial details. I agree. There's already a question in Slack about that. And that was on my list of things to ask about. So maybe we'll loop back to that. But first, Yang uh, is uh, here in person to ask a question. So go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and introduce yourself, Yang. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, hi. Um, okay. I'm a second year PhD student at National University of Singapore. So my question is in your per CPU scheduling model, um, uh, how do you, uh, so uh, are those uh, kernel threads fixed to a single core from, uh, from the start? Like uh, in Linux kernel, they will perform uh, load balancing from time to time, right? Um, so do you actually forbid uh, migration of kernel threads? So uh, 
what well, uh, yeah <laughs> Yeah, so the, the agents, the agent threads themselves, those are fixed mm -hmm. to each CPU, just to be clear, because they're, they're an embodiment of that CPU. But then the agents themselves um, implement the policy, and they're free to migrate uh, threads across CPUs as needed. One of the example policies in our repository uh, does this mm -hmm. in order to get better load balancing. So it's, it's all in user space, and it's ultimately uh, whatever you want to do that's absolutely uh, supported. So. Oh, okay. Thank you. Question from Slack. Um, so the next question from Slack uh, is uh, from Sara Bagchi from uh, Purdue. <coughs> and the question is, because Ghost is running in user space, are there security sensitivities? Could you hear that? Uh, yeah, are there security sensitivities? Yeah. Because because it's it's yeah. Sure. Uh, so I, I Sorry, I meant sure I'll answer the question. No, there, there are not. Uh, there are not any security concerns that this raises uh, per se. The the ghost agents are a trusted system process. Uh, they have root access. Um, they're, they're, we we view them um, really just as an extension of the kernel into user space. Uh, the, you know, I'm not sure if you had any specific examples there. Um, you know, beyond that, we have support in the kernel for fault tolerance and for detecting misbehaving agents. For example, we have a watchdog. If we see that an agent hasn't scheduled something or is acting oddly, and we have a set of heuristics for this, then we can kill the agent and fall back to a default policy such as CFS. Um, yeah. So Neil, do you have anything to add about that? Yeah, um, certainly. The, the agent is, is a privileged process for sure but it is not implicitly trusted because it is privileged. As Jack said, we have mechanisms in the kernel to detect uh, misbehavior either because of maliciousness or just a bug. Um, it does not have access to any additional memory space other than what it has allocated by itself and the transaction regions. Um, the influence of the agent is restricted to the enclave that it's operating in. So it cannot reach across the enclave and try to mess with other CFS threads, other kernel threads, or even other ghost threads that are running outside the enclave. So, um, oh, and one, so certainly we are cognizant of the fact that because it's in user space, it may not. It may be easier to make mistakes because you you link against libraries and they, they might have bugs. It might be easy to to corrupt your own state or to get hijacked. But we do have. We don't implicitly trust it. We, we do have backstops in the kernel uh, to prevent it from misbehaving. And one thing to add to that is that, uh, again, I, I mentioned before how Linux has these stacked scheduling classes where you have the stop class, real time, CFS. Ghost is all the way at the bottom of this stack, and this means it has the lowest priority. And that's fine if, you know, in terms of performance of the other upper classes are idle. But what this means, importantly for security, is that if you have ghost agents that are malfunctioning and, and trying to DOS the machine or take it over, you can run, you know, like your SSH server or something in a higher priority class like CFS or real time, and, and those will have absolute priority over ghosts. So you can still uh, gain back control of the machine if, if your ghost agents are, are malfunctioning and malicious. All right, I was gonna uh, do another question, but I, to keep things on track, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move things along. Uh, there's a lot of great questions still um, for you guys on, the, on Slack, so engage with those. And if we have a little bit of time, we can bring um, you guys back and um, people can ask their questions for themselves. But thanks, Jack and Neil. And uh, now we'll move on to the, the next talk, um, which um, this talk dovetails right into the next one. So next, uh, Costas Cafes is gonna tell us about Syrup, which is a um, incorporates use this ghosts user space uh, CPU scheduling framework that uh, Jack just described. But it Thank you so much, uh, Jack, for the great presentation. Um, so do we have any hands up? Uh, we don't have any hands up yet, oh, do we? I don't see any raised hand, but. Uh... Swapnil, do you see your raised hand? Okay, Shengliang has a live question. Shengliang, have you been promoted? Yes. Go ahead. Hi. Hey. Mm. 
Do you hear him? Well, I, I don't. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't hear. Yeah. Um, the, the Maybe you want to turn off your video and try. Or maybe you can post on chat uh, on Slack. Sure. And while he's doing that, uh, let me just read. Uh, there are a couple of questions uh, on the Slack channel from Emma uh, from UC Berkeley. Can you hear me? Still um, choppy. Uh, sorry. Uh, okay. Now, now it's better. Maybe you wanna you wanna ask the question. So, uh, may I need to uh, ask it again? Yes, please. Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, you also mentioned that one of the problems of existing schedulers is the difficulty to customize policies for new hardware, such as GPUs and TPUs. So did the current design of Ghost consider incorporating GPU or TPU scheduling? Would it be a possible additional efforts to apply Ghost for GPU and TPU scheduling? Uh, I think he asked, would it be possible to use Ghost for GPU and TPU scheduling? So when I, uh, so when I made that point in the in the talk, I was referring specifically to doing kernel thread scheduling. You know, you might want to put your thread on, let's say, a NUMA node in the same socket connected to your accelerator. Um, now, could it be extended to support actually thread scheduling within GPUs and TPUs? Um, that sounds like a really interesting future research direction. So I'd be happy to talk with you um, offline about that. I know those sorts of systems tend to have the scheduler integrated into the hardware, but it would be cool to yeah. think about the possibilities of using an abstraction like Ghost. And I actually think, you know, the next talk, Syrup, might be super relevant to that. So definitely think it's interesting. and We should chat about that after. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We can have an offline talk. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, John Yu uh, has the next question. Could you please introduce yourself and your affiliation, please? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, hi. Uh, <clears throat> hello, my name is John Yu Park from Songyungan University. Thank you for the interesting work and great talk. Uh, first, I want to ask do you have any like quantitative data about overheads of communication between kernel and user space for the information. Maybe you use the, e, ex, the extended Berkeley pack, pack filter, maybe. But anyways, do you have any like idea about the overheads? And I want to ask, does Ghost consider NUMA topology uh, regarding memory access or stuff and also load balancing? And yes, finally, so those wanna, are, oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah, finally, I want to ask about it. Like with NVM SSD, each core has its own software queue. So, do you have any, any idea to integrate CPU scheduler and IO scheduler by any chance? Yeah, sure. So those are all great questions. Um, so, um, first, with regard to the overhead between you know communication between the kernel and user space, um, we have a yeah. lot of micro benchmarks in the paper, and what we show basically is that message passing, um, you, you know, takes let's say if you're transitioning to a, to a local agent, you have the P thread switch to the agent's thread, and then you have the switch to user space to read the message. So in the paper, we show that takes about 700 nanoseconds to do. Mm. Whereas on the other hand, if you have the spinning global agent, that takes about 250 nanoseconds. So these are really low overheads um, comparable to existing kernel schedulers. Mm. And then in terms of committing a transaction itself, we have micro benchmarks for that. So those are cheap, again, about a microsecond. Um, now, your second question was about NUMA topology. So absolutely, and that was uh, that's a really great question. That was uh, an important part of why we wanted Ghost, you know, among other reasons. So for our Google search workload, for example, some of the requests are memory bound and integrating NUMA topology awareness into the policy was really key in terms of getting on par with CFS for QPS um, and for tail latency. And in fact, I, I would take, your point even further on AMD, they have these like CCX structures where you have basically a bunch of different cores, each sharing their own L3 cache. And that that makes uh, getting the memory, uh, scheduling around the memory an even more difficult problem. And, and uh, Ghost really benefits us there by allowing us to customize to AMD and do it quickly and try a lot of different things. You know, at least for our team, that's a new different sort of cache structure. Um, and then last, uh, 
uh, I'm looking at your uh, Slack question uh, with uh, NVMe. All right, so can you integrate the CPU scheduler and the IO scheduler? Yeah, you can. Um, I'd be happy to chat offline because that sounds like interesting future work. And in fact, I would say the next talk, Syrup by my colleague Kostis, um, talks specifically about injecting things into the kernel with BPF to do scheduling for IO. And he, uh, we actually integrate that with Ghost. Now it was for a network workload, but I, I think uh, doing it for SSD would be a great direction too, and it would definitely be possible. So did I, did I address all your questions? Yeah, actually, that was great. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, thank you. Just, uh, I just have one point of clarification on the second question, um, which on Slack where you ask, does Ghost take into account new topology when doing load balancing or placement? I just want to re reiterate that Ghost is a framework to implement policies. And absolutely, Ghost provides the information that a policy would need to, uh, to appropriately allocate tasks to NUMA nodes or chiplets and do the load balancing accordingly. But Ghost by itself is not, it's not doing any scheduling. It's, it's providing you the hooks to do the scheduling. So I just wanted to, to clarify that because a lot of times people conflate Ghost, the sort of scaffolding and the policies that we have presented in the paper on top of that scaffolding. Okay, thanks. Any other questions, live questions? You know, Emma, if we have time, asked a good one about BPF that might be worth addressing. If, okay. So Emma, Emma asked a really good question, you know, can BPF be used to implement scheduling policies you know, in the kernel instead of ghost. And that, that's a really good point. So, you know, we we view ghost and BPF as complementary rather than competing. So ghost lets you overcome some of the limitations of BPF. It can, it's a high learning curve to BPF. You, you have to kind of work around this BPF verifier. Um, so we think that BPF is ideal for accelerating ghost fast paths in the kernel, while, you know, you can run higher level control plane stuff in the ghost agents themselves. Um, and advancements in ghost or BPF let you move the boundary uh, between the two, but ultimately they're complementary. And I, I think the next talk with Costis will again make, make this more clear as to how they can work together. I'm not sure if Neil has anything to add about that, but that's uh, the, the good question. So. Uh, no, the, the only thing I'll, I'll add is a, a link to the Slack where we have sort of more things that we did with BPF that we could not uh, put in the paper. Thanks, Jack and Neil. Uh, let's move on to the next paper, but please do hang around to the end of the session, uh, Jack and Neil, if there are any questions right at the end, if there's time between yep. them. Thanks. Absolutely. Thanks. So our next uh, speaker is uh, Kostis Kafis. I'm sorry if I pronounce the name wrong. Please do correct me um, if I'm wrong. Uh, Kosti 